All right, welcome back to the Law and Crime Network, Law and Crime Report. My name is Bob Bianchi. I'll be hosting the show for you today. Let's go back to Covington, Kentucky in 1978, where there was a brutal rape, sodomy, and kidnapping um, of a woman that was unsolved until police were able to match fingerprints with new technology leading to the arrest and conviction of Michael Tate, who is now 78 years old, that he agreed to a 12-year sentence. But the detectives uh, have also found a lot of other information about Mr. Tate. Let's go to a detective, uh, Coy Cox, from the Boone County Sheriff's Office. She was an excellent uh, witness in a crime because of the details and stuff that she remembered. And while I say she had a strong will to live, she, and she did, but she also had a strong will to make sure that she remembered everything she could about this guy and this crime because she wanted him uh, caught. It is my opinion. I do not have the facts to support this at this point in time, but we are pursuing those um, vigorously, that he is a serial rapist and a serial murderer. The only thing that we have proven at this point in time is that he uh, did the rape that happened on October 1st, 1978, and he has been convicted of other rapes and sexual offenses in, in the past. Okay, so serial rapist. Apparently, the defendant also con uh, uh, confessed to having committed rapes in other jurisdictions. We have Anjanette Levy with us, a law and crime reporter. Anjanette, uh, number one, not only is this unbelievable with the manner in which you're able, I used to say this as a prosecutor, take everything you can, everything, because you never know down the road how new technology is going to be able to solve a crime. Well, that apparently happened here. But talk to us, what else are they finding out about this guy where they're suspicious of serial rapes in other jurisdictions as well? Yeah, you know, this is a really, um, you know, Bob, thanks for having me, first of all. But second of all, this is an awful case. And um, it's really a testament to these police officers in Boone County, Kentucky, the sheriff's office, that they were able to solve this case after so many years. Um, this happened back on October 1st, 1978. Um, this woman was attacked in her apartment of her garage. Um, she survived, thank goodness. She was raped and tortured and sodomized for several hours in Tate's vehicle. And um, they were trying to solve a cold case homicide back in 2019. They were looking at a cold case and they went back and looked at some similar cases and they found this rape case. They went back, they got the case file, they found that fingerprint in the case file and they reran it. But nothing came back in 1978 when they first ran it. They reran it and it came back to Michael Tate. They said they went down to Georgia and talked to him, and he gave a detailed confession and confessed to multiple rapes in multiple states throughout the South and on the East Coast. Anjanette, do we, uh, th these guys always fascinated me when I was investigating and prosecuting these kind of cases. Um, for some odd reason, once they get caught, they seem to love to be able to tell about their exploits. Um, but there seems to be some memory lapse with him. Like, he, he isn't really sure necessarily of the location or exactly who the person was, but he was trying to assist police. Do they think there was any deception by him, or are they investigating other rapes because he simply can't remember? You know, it's, it, and it's interesting that you bring that up. And um, they said that I think they believe he was being truthful. I don't think they believe that he was uh, being dishonest when he was talking about some of these rapes. And they said they had to kind of really refresh his memory in a lot of instances. Like they'd they'd bring up a specific incident and they'd say, how about this um, interstate or something like that? How about this highway? And then they would kind of refresh his memory. The only th time they thought maybe he was being dishonest is when they went to the rapes that ended in murders. Well, okay, Anjanette Levy, law and crime reporter, uh, really greatly thank you for being on the show and illuminating us on this solving of this cold case. And from what I understand, the victim is very satisfied, not only with the result, but they don't have to go into court because he's accepted responsibility and has received the sentence. Thank you, Anjanette. Mm -hmm. No problem. Okay, we got to switch gears, guys. Uh, Chad and Lori Daybell, we talked about this last week. There was a motion that was filed by the defense team saying that the prosecutor should be removed from the case for improper conduct and intimidating witnesses and undue influence on witnesses based on a conversation that the prosecutor was having with family members of the defendants, even though it was in the presence of a lawyer. 
Um, he can stay on the case. That's the ruling. That's what we anticipated would occur. Let's listen to the judge making the ruling. Now, if Ms. Shiflett in the future is called to testify at trial in this case, the court would require a pretrial hearing based on the evidence I heard at this hearing, um, which has been referred to as a taint hearing. And that was done in the case of State versus Severson, 147 Idaho 694. It's discussed in Head Note 46. Uh, so I would require that type of hearing before her testimony based on the evidence been presented by the defendants in this case. Um, the court at this time has no other information of any other such conversations that may have occurred with other potential witnesses. Uh, if they did occur, then there may be a possibility of a future request for additional taint hearings for those witnesses as well. Uh, but that's not an issue before the court as the only information submitted was the transcript and recording of the conversation with Ms. Shiflett. So finally, uh, there were some concerning things in the recording in regards to the uh, derogatory comments made by Mr. Wood about Mr. Means. Uh, I'm not going to issue an order to apologize or anything to that effect, but it's certainly my practice to always encourage a civility amongst counsel in my cases, and I'll just leave it up to Mr. Wood to determine whether or not he thinks that is an appropriate thing to do in order for continued civility and professionalism going forward in this case. Hey, Judge Stephen Boyce, rendering that ruling prosecutor could stay on the case. Let's get to Ann Bremner uh, from Seattle, former prosecuting attorney, Kings County District Attorney's Office, which is a prolific uh, attorney general uh, office, prosecutor's office. I know that I've worked with them. Uh, tried over 200 cases there. That is a really extraordinary statistic. Trial attorney that emphasizes now civil rights, catastrophic injury, and criminal law. A TV legal analyst across the spectrum, including Law Crime Network, Fox News, MSNBC, CNN, and HLN. Truly fair and balanced. And welcome to the show. Yes. Yeah. Hey, thanks for having me. Great to see you. Of course. Good to see you and Happy New Year. So um, I'm looking at the motions that are filed in this case, and I found this to be extraordinary. So the defense was saying, uh, that they were coerced, these witnesses, unduly influenced, coached, intimidated. And I want to get, uh, you know, when we listen to the tapes of what we're saying, because it was so repetitiously recorded, unbeknownst to the prosecutor, the two witnesses that were from the Daybell families were uh, in the presence of an attorney when this occurred. And right. the judge made note that there was no objection by the attorney to anything that the prosecutor was doing. And the judge disagreed that Wood did anything to try to influence the witness testimony. Um, and uh, as I said, the lawyer never objected. And he found no damages to the clients, Lori and Chad. What are your general thoughts about how the judge ruled in this case? I'll, I'll give you mine. I, I never thought the prosecutor would be thrown off of this. Yeah, and you know, I the prosecutor wins when justice is done. I mean, that was a, that was the mantra in the King County Prosecutor's Office when I was there. And you, you look at this, and I kept thinking, why did they file this? Are they trying to get more time? I mean, obviously, they don't want to have this go on forever. Do they really think they're going to win it? Because the judge did a very measured, uh, took a very measured approach to this. He was right. No objection from counsel. There, there was no damage to to any of the defendants. It was simply something like throwing a wrench, you know, into the works or attempting to by the defense. And finally, I kind of think, Bob, that the prosecutor should be kind of flattered, maybe, because he, if they want him off the case that badly, he must be doing his job. Hey, Ann, I want to get to something that that a lot of people have been debating and I think missing a little bit of a point. And certainly, we love to mm -hmm. educate our, our law and crime audience here is that an attorney has an ethical obligation to investigate a case, to speak to witness. It could be considered malpractice not to do that. Now, clearly, if you're right. trying to unduly influence them or change their opinion or get them to testify untruthfully, then you've crossed a line. So, I, you know, th this is something that was surprising to me. And my last point, and issue to hear your opinion, is that a judge can always say that the defense still has an opportunity to cross-examine the witnesses in the case to bring out what it was the prosecutor did. In other words, I would be saying as a judge, here's the fancy term, right? And it doesn't go to the admissibility, right. but to the weight of the evidence and the jury can make its yes. own assessment. Thoughts? Absolutely. 
absolutely. You are so right on. I agree on every point that you've made. And the fact is, in a case like this, you can get up there and say, didn't the prosecutor say this? Did he try to influence you that way? And the fact is, he didn't, it sounds like. It sounds like the witness, you know, stayed steady and true to whatever they're going to say. And, and the other part is the prosecutor has special duties under the ethical rules, as you well know. And, and that those include, you know, basically conducting a fair or imbalanced, I guess, investigation, not making inappropriate uh, remarks to the press uh, and things of that nature. They're held to a higher standard than other counsel in a criminal case, and rightly so. So you look bad in part of this by disparaging the other lawyer. Judge didn't say, you go apologize, but he insinuated that should happen. Yeah, that was a result of a comment he made about the current lawyer, uh, or one of the lawyers that Chad and Lori had uh, saying that he had no experience, he had no background, and but uh, for this kind of case, the fact is the prosecutor was right. He, he, it, in a weird way, that almost assists the defense by giving them that information so they can hire competent right. counsel. But I'll tell you why the prosecutor has a vested interest in this, and Bremner, is because as a prosecutor, when I'm securing convictions, I don't want them later reversed because there's going right. to be an argument of ineffective assistance of counsel. Right, and we used to call that um, defending the redoubt. You get the doubt the first time that's raised in the trial, and then you have to come back and do it again on appeal. So you want to kind of preserve your record, you know, very carefully, and also make sure that you don't have to do a redoubt defense or a redo because somebody was ineffective. Um, basically, everybody's entitled to a competent counsel. This is a very, very serious case, and so you want to protect that as well, so you don't have, end up on an appeal and with a big do-over in a case that is going to take a lot of time to ferret out everything that happened and to try. No prosecutor wants the big do-over because it's never good for them on balance. Thank you right. very much, Ann. Great commentary. Listen, Elijah McLean is back in the news in a very interesting development with regard to that police shooting, uh, police, rather, a fa in custody fatality. And we're going to be talking about that on the other end of the break with a new guest. Stay with us. Okay, in our show today, we have coming up Elijah McClain plus the Capitol insurrection and a couple of other very interesting cases. I hope you stick with us, but let's go a little bit more into Chad Daybell. Again, the judge rejecting a request by the defense to throw the prosecutor off the case. Let's listen to Chad Daybell's attorney making the closing argument in that motion. I cannot see how Mr. Wood's statements leading Summer Shiflett through this process of, oh, it's gonna be murder charges and it would sure be nice if we could uh, communicate with Miss, uh, with Miss Vallow about this. And, and as Dr. Uh, uh, Davidson implied, it seemed to be, and Dr. Newton implied, it seemed to be a back way for Mr. Wood to try to get Miss Vallow to speak. Now that's clearly a violation if you're trying, even secretly or indirectly to try to communicate with a witness or with a defendant who has legal counsel. That is a big problem. In addition, he violated the preamble. He is not doing this. There is no way anyone can suggest that his comments did not influence or attempt to influence a witness in a case. That's not justice. 3.8, the prosecutor's obligations. He violated his obligation as a prosecutor to try to present an impartial hearing and his heightened his heightened obligation to do everything that he could to do be fair and afford the opportunity for a defendant to have a fair trial is a violation, another violation. And judge, I can spend hours going through and point out a number of these. Okay, so those are the arguments made by Chad uh, Daybell's attorney. We have Dr. John Del Toro that is going to join us uh, with, um, uh, Ms. Bremner, and we have a licensed psychologist out of Arizona and Texas, a psychological and counseling consulting services out of Mesa, forensic psychology, provides therapy for adult sex offenders, and general risk threat assessments. Doc, let me ask you, he's talking about the undue info. I always love having you on the show because you, you got to get into the psychology of this. He's talking about the undue influence that the prosecutor exerted on these witnesses and making the connection that they would then go to the defendant um, and exert some undue influence over them. And of course, a prosecutor can never sp speak to a defendant that is represented by counsel. What did you think of those undue influence arguments they were making? 
You know, I listened to Dr. Davidson, who was the forensic psychologist that uh, provided testimony on this case. Now, he was looking at uh, interrogation and interview techniques, and I see where the defense attorney is coming from. But I don't think he quite caught on to what Dr. Davidson, the forensic psychologist, was talking about, and that is intentionality. Was the prosecutor really intending to influence uh, Summer Shiflet to then contact uh, Lori and have her then come back? I don't know that that's technically what he was trying to do. So I think the forensic psychologist is really trying to place into context what exactly it was that was happening. Now, Summer Shiflet could easily have misinterpreted statements or interpreted statements in her own sort of state of mind, wanting to help uh, a family member, not wanting the severity of things uh, to, to go against someone that she cared about. Is it possible yeah. that the prosecutor knew that that's what he was doing? Perhaps. And Brian, what, what do you think about that? I mean, you know, again, the argument the defense lawyer is making is technically correct. Yeah. If you're doing something in order to try to, to, as a prosecutor, get to the defendant without the defendant's counsel knowing about it, that clearly would be an ethics violation. But it would be really peculiar that that, to, to the doctor's point, that that was the intention of the prosecutor when essentially he was saying something that, that went against his case, get a better lawyer. Well, absolutely. And of course, if the prosecutor cannot contact the defendant who's represented by counsel. That would be a direct violation and would probably get him bumped up the case. But he probably didn't mean to. You can't prove that he did. And the fact is that that didn't come to pass, you know, in terms of, of that expectation. I don't know the last time a prosecutor's been thrown off a case. I was just thinking that Duke Lacrosse case, Mike Neifong, of course, was prosecuted. Um, and disbarred. I mean, you see it in some of these high-profile cases, but day to day in this country, motions like this are routinely denied, and rightly so in this instance. Yeah, I, I agree. I've only came close once, and that was because I happened to have been a defense attorney for the son of a father who was later accused of murder <laughs> that I was prosecuting. So they were arguing a conflict of interest, but certainly um, I've only seen one case in my entire career where uh, an assistant prosecutor made a stupid mis mistake and spoke directly to the defendant. Again, in one of these scenarios where he was trying to help him out, he felt bad for the guy, believe it or not. Uh, but he did it without the presence of, without the presence of the defense attorney. So that became a little bit of a problem. Uh, overall, mm -hmm. Doc, what, is there any psychological points that you see in this case from the standpoint of the whole Chad and Lori Daybell and this craziness that they're involved in in their lives and? Like, I, I know that you can't give an assessment, you haven't evaluated them, but what are you seeing with this and the religious implications? It, it sounds a little crazy to me, and I would hire somebody like you to say, hey, I know I can't admit this as evidence, but what's going on here with these folks? Yeah, I mean, th this would probably require a whole team of forensic psychologists just to, uh, just to kind of untwine everything that's going on. The, the key thing is that if you leave the room with, with one of these two feeling confused, it's obvious that one of them is lying. So there's a lot of pieces in here that are just confounding what is the absolute truth, and only those two people really know the truth about what happened. Yeah, it's, this is going to be a fascinating case. Well, listen, the defense just had their aggressive argument there. They obviously lost the case, but the prosecutor was not going to go away in the night. Now, the prosecutor himself was not arguing this case, but he had one of the other assistant prosecutors arguing for him. Let's take a listen to their closing. If this court finds any questionable conduct, um, one of the factors the court has to consider is, okay, what is uh, the solution that's going to be least damaging in, in the situation? I note, and the court notes, there's not a single one of the defendant's experts, all were asked, if they know of a single case in a situation like this where a prosecutor was disqualified by a court. I don't know that. The defense experts had no idea. I mean, there's not a single case that leads that to believe. So I assume that perhaps in those type of situation, courts are finding alternate solutions uh, short of disqualification. So again, the third factor of Weaver, also adopted by the Idaho Supreme Court, to establish the disqualification of the lawyer. The last factor, Your Honor, whether the possibility of public suspicion will outweigh any benefits that might accrue 
to continue representation. Again, Your Honor, the burden is upon the defense. Uh, they claim quite a bit of information of, well, we didn't, we didn't call it as well. It's their burden. It's their burden throughout. The Idaho Supreme Court has said that very directly. Uh, so their burden of, is upon them to show any public suspension or suspicion. None has been offered in this case. Uh, Ms. Shiflett is not Mr. Daybell. She is not Ms. Vallow. And I think this is a perfect opportunity to explain to our audience that we have statutes and we have a book of statutes and we have court rules that give us the guidelines as to how you proceed in court. And then we have evidence rules. Those are the three main Bibles, if you will, of criminal trial practitioners. But this, this, this lawyer is also referring to case law. And so we have these big books of all these rules. And then we have tons of cases that are interpreting those rules. And that's what he's referring to. There. Can you talk about that interplay there and, and give us an insight as to what his argument was, the prosecuting attorney, as to why the rules that they were talking about were not implicated or they, the defense did not do a good enough job based on the case law that interprets those rules. He actually did an excellent job and it was a smart move to have someone else argue the motion. Um, he said, you know, you have a fool for a client if you represent yourself, as they always say, especially if you're the prosecutor in a high profile case. So what he's basically saying is, here's some ethical rules that apply to prosecutors. These are within the court rules, smaller book than the big books with the cases. And, and But there weren't violations here. And then when we look at what the cases say in our jurisdiction, basically they're saying there are factors that have to be looked at by the court in terms of kind of the death penalty of a prosecutor. In other words, throwing a prosecutor off a case and disqualification. What needs to be shown? Well, he's going through those factors from the case law uh, in, in, in his jurisdiction and then arguing how certain cases interpret maybe the main case it sets for the standard. It's usually a test of some sort, one, two, three, four, the types of things that have to be shown. And he's saying the defense has the burden. That's right. They brought the motion. They have the burden of persuading this judge that they're right, that there were ethical violations uh, by this prosecutor that warrant disqualification in this particular case under the state, state law and any particular state statutes. Finally, in the evidence rules, once we get out of this arena, as you well know, Bob, we end up in the courtroom. And there's testimony, testimony from witnesses who swear under oath. As you said before so aptly, this goes to the weight and not admissibility of that testimony. The fact is, cross-examination can ensue where they say that, that there was you know, undue influence on the witness. And, and so that's kind of the end road of all of this. But the prosecutor wins when, when justice is served. Prosecutors aren't supposed to be there to win. They're supposed to be there to do justice. Right. You know, we always talk about evidence rule 404 a lot. We see that in the Cosby case, in the Epstein case. A lot of these where you generally bad character evidence is not admissible unless, and it mentions right. a number of criteria, including motive. But then you have case law that interprets what kind of motive is and what are the four factors in the Cofield analysis, at least right. in the state of New Jersey. Uh, and you have to meet each of those elements in order for it to be admissible. So there's a lot of nuance in terms of what lawyers have to do when arguing a case like this. So... Doc, um, I, 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 my producer wants to tell me something, I think, and so I'm just going to hold. Okay, so, Doc, we are going to get to you first. I swear, I promise, on the other end of the break, stay with us. All right, again, another one, the twist and turn in the Elijah McLean case. As you know, prosecutors had refused to bring charges or go to the grand jury with respect to the three officers that were involved in the young man's death. This occurred back in August 24th, 2019, where he's walking home from a convenience store, was approached by the Aurora, uh, Colorado police officers because they had been dispatched there on a 911 call indicating that there was suspicious activity with a person wearing a ski mask. There was an encounter, which we'll discuss before, that led ultimately to his uh, unfortunate death. And now the governor of Colorado issued an order and the attorney general of Colorado is opening up a grand jury investigation after 2 million people signed a petition to have a secondary investigation. Let's listen to the police chief uh, when he was speaking about the actions of these three uh, police officers shortly after the incident. It's reprehensible. And that's why they no longer work here. Um, I would like to give you some information about those officers. Uh, Kyle Dietrich, who 
which is depicted in the photo. Uh, he has been on the New Orleans Police Department for three years, uh, since 2016. Jaron Jones, depicted in the photo, he has been on three years, also 2016, and he is the one that resigned. Erica Marrero, uh, depicted in the photo, has been employed for two years, and was hired in 2018. The last officer that I fired received this photo and replied with an inappropriate comment of ha ha. There was absolutely nothing funny about this. That officer is Jason Rosenblatt. He has been on for three years. He is not being involved in the, because of him being in the incident of the photo, he's being fired for his lack and utter inability to do the right thing here. And to say ha ha when he was engaged in the incident with Elijah McClain is absolutely unacceptable. Right, it's the police chief. Let's let's go back again and remember that the prosecutor refused to bring charges, indicating because there is no cause of death listed by the medical examiner. How do I try a homicide case when I don't know what the cause of death is? That's the argument. Uh, Doc, I want to go to you first because I promise I go to you first. I want to bring out some um, interesting aspects. When the police encountered him, supposedly captured on body cam video, is him saying, "Quote: I'm an introvert." Please respect the boundaries that I am speaking of. They're telling him to relax, according to reports, where he's saying, I'm going to have to uh, change the situation, the police officer. They also threaten him with the release of the canine that can bite him. There is resistance going on, according to the police officers. There's a struggle going on. Uh, paramedics are brought to the scene, and they administer him a dose of ketamine, which is a highly powerful anesthetic. The ME notes that the ketamine in his system was within normal therapeutic levels. Um, with respect to the cause of death, he writes, the medical examiner, intense physical exertion and a narrow carotid, left carotid artery uh, when, uh, were contributing factors along with the history of asthma and the carotid hold because they had placed him in a carotid hold. He had passed out, they let go, he woke up again. Um, and they basically say, this is what the medical examiner says. I've never seen anything like it. I mean, I've seen undetermined written down as the cause of death, but this medical examiner kind of gave you the Chinese menu of options uh, that you could choose from. He said the cause of death could either be an accident, homicide, or natural causes, which basically means I don't have a cause of death that I can specifically state. First, before I get to Anne on the cause of death and the significance of that for prosecutors, I want to talk to you about what are you seeing in this young man who by all estimations was a, a beautiful person, uh, he's a hardworking person, a decent kid, has this encounter. Um, what, what's going on here? Was, it, was, was he frightened? Was he you know, out of control? Can you give us any idea the psychological makeup of what was going on there and if the cops could have treated the situation better? Well, for sure, the, the police could have treated the situation better. I want, and I want to go back to that initial statement that he says, which is, I'm different. I'm an introvert. So he understands that there is something that is happening in the environment around him that is scaring him. And so he wants to tell the people that are scaring him that he's not exactly the threat that they are interpreting him to be. And so from there, things just kind of decompensate. Everyone is triggered. There's a lot of adrenaline going. So a lot of problems that are happening. And for sure, the police could have acted differently. Yeah, and uh, this this is tough. You know that I'm a person that does not like politics mixing in to prosecution. I think it is a toxic cocktail, as I call it. But nevertheless, yeah. two million signatures means a lot to people who get elected. We got the governor, who I guess I mean the governor never interfered in any case I ever had, uh, is basically ordering the attorney general uh, to move forward with the case. The attorney general says they're going to do a fair review of the facts and law. And look, I get it. A fair evaluation of, of a case is essential. And if the prosecutor below didn't do the appropriate thing, but there's been no such finding of that. And that just gets me nervous. You, that's number one. So your general thoughts on that. And to the point of the prosecutor who didn't bring the charges at first saying, as I have to prove beyond the reasonable doubt the cause of death, and I don't have it here. What do you think? Right. And, it, you know, I read that, and at first, it's, it's just a, it's a horrible case. I mean, it basically, he was walking from a convenience store with an iced tea and ends up dying. And, and the police 
custody or, or thereafter. But if you don't, if you can't prove a homicide, I mean, like you said, those are the categories from a medical examiner's office, and they're not able to say it's a homicide, and or there was something other than undetermined. Then you you can't get off the ground with the prosecution. It's unfortunate, but they don't have a cause of death. Um, the Casey Anthony case was problematic on cause of death. Remember, of course, the jury acquitted. What was the cause of her death? You know, they, they, that was a little bit different. It was obvious. It was homicidal, but they couldn't pinpoint what it was given um, the decomposition of her remains. But in this case, you've got the carotid artery uh, that's mentioned and this history of asthma, uh, et, et cetera, but, but really nothing else. I thought, are, gonna, are they going to say, you know, excited delirium? Are they going to say, you know, something like that? But they didn't. And these types of chokeholds or sleeper holes, as they call them, are generally disallowed in most police departments. So yeah, I will say, and just to be, I guess, yeah. you know, having a review of the political. I will say, just for purposes of being fair to this record here, from what is being reported by the uh, uh, police agencies that are responsible for overseeing them, a carotid hold is not in Colorado, at least at that time a prohibited practice, and they found nothing wrong with the unreasonableness of it. Excellent points with regard to the case. And again, it, it's a tragic death. Uh, it will be interesting if I were prosecutor, I would have told you if I had no, if I had a medical examiner's report like that, you could be assured it would be going to two other medical examiners to see if I could get a cross-section of opinion before I would have made that ultimate conclusion. Maybe they did that, but we don't see anything like that in the record. Okay, we got to switch gears, guys. Oh my gosh. The insurrection, um, you know, at the Capitol. I mean, we've all seen this. I, as an attorney, I was sitting there in complete amazement that the foundation of our uh, government was being attacked, of our democracy, irrespective of the partisan politics. Uh, I, and, and from a law enforcement officer point of view, I, I was in shock, like I think most of you were, that there was no police response. I mean, we, you know, what could believe that these people could get away with that and that it took so long for the other police agencies and National Guard uh, to get there. Uh, Doc, I got to go to you first with this. We see a mix of individuals, a mix of groups. Uh, they're, they're all not monolithic. They're, they're anarchists there. There's white supremacists there. There's neo-Nazis there. There's people that just want to be there and be at an event and have a benign reason. There are protesters there that want to rightfully express their freedom of expression. Um, there is no excuse, and I'm going to make this very clear because I'm getting tired of hearing this. There is no excuse for rioting and violent conduct. I don't care what your position is, where you are, Democrat, Republican, or otherwise. Going into the Capitol doc uh, of, of, of the United States seat of its democracy sends not only a bad message to our country, but a horrible national security uh, interest to the rest of the world that sees, wow. Man, look how easy it was to attack democracy. John, can you give me any insights as to what is going on in the ethos of these groups where you have a state legislator who's now lost his career? You have professional people. You have military people. You have people that have led otherwise law-abiding lives, and you have people there that have not led law-abiding lives, that lives are going to be destroyed, not to mention the way I did to our democracy. How is this going on? And can it be countered, or is the genie out of the bottle? As you said, Bob, there are all different kinds of people that were there doing all different kinds of things. So if all different kinds of people are there, then what we have to look at is the language being used. Once we understand the language of these sorts of individuals that are willing to incite violence, then we can start figuring out ways of counteracting them. Now, as a threat assessor, I'm, I'm looking at language, I'm looking at all of these different things when I'm asked to see whether or not someone is going to be potentially violent. But it's important to understand that this didn't just happen. Like people just didn't show up and then just decide to do this. This was a long plan, right? Other benign protesters who saw what were happening, yeah, maybe they show up because they see everything that was going on, but there were individuals who have been communicating for a long period of time that this is something that they had wanted to do. And of course it's gonna be the capital because they're trying to send a message. Again, it's the language being used, right? They, they believe that the capital has been corrupted in such a way that goes against what their own thought process is. And other people are going to fall in line. It doesn't really have anything to do with color, or greed, or nationalism. It's about violence. It's about hate. 
It's about inciting other people to do something wrong. And so the more influential that language is, the more people are going to kind of fall in line. So yeah, there's plenty of things that can still be done, but are we in a position to actually do those things? Red flag laws, right? Monitoring chats, that our intelligence uh, agencies, looking at the dark web and looking at other social media platforms for the language of hate and the language of violence, because there's a ton out there and nothing's going to stop these people from sharing their thoughts. And very quickly, um, I, 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 look, there were so many failures here in intelligence. It was out there. It wasn't hard to find. But I'm a believer that there should be domestic terrorism uh, task force put into place. They should be allowed to monitor these things. I know a lot of people say Big Brother or whatever, but this is one of our significant threats that we have here. And I'm not talking about monitoring right. every citizen's communication. What do you think about what we need to go forward legally and do to, in order to give some teeth to what these investigators say, we're being hamstrung by not having the proper laws. Well, yeah, I think that's going to change. I mean, I think we're all speechless about this, which is so deeply troubled, and it's got to change. I mean, people died, and there was, it, it was just so horrific that there's got to be a concrete, meaningful, um, practical response. I think so far, yeah. of course, they're doing a great job of tracking down the folks that were there. Of course, they all wanted to be on social media. They all wanted their picture taken. Mm -hmm. So they were kind of readily ascertainable, their identities. But I think you're yeah. right. That's what we need to do going forward. What we balance in this country is the rights to do, do certain things um, with the rights to be free from certain things. And that's what this is all about as we go forward. Well, wow, really tragic day. And mark my words, something about this seems squirrely, as we would say in the business, about how this intelligence didn't get through and some of the response of the police officers, most of whom acted extremely valiantly. But I am really looking forward mm -hmm. to the investigation as to how command leadership was absent in the middle of this chaos. Guys, we got to take a quick break. We'll be right back. Me, no, you don't have no. to explain nothing to her. Take the face off. That's mine. Literally, get it back. Please. Are you kidding me? You feel like there's only one one iPhone made in the world? No. Okay, then show me the. Show no, me my... you get get a life over yeah, there. No, What's on your last round? You better go use find find my iPhone. Go yeah, do that. Find my iPhone is off. Okay, right no, no, you, you can't. No, I'm the manager of the yes. hotel. I don't yes, care. He will this right is my now. son. Hey, Did you see me just come downstairs out of the fucking elevator? Yeah, I'm trying to help, man. No, but you're not helping. I what am. you mean is disrespectful. No, I'm trying to settle the no. situation. We, I'm, I'm my son to... has nothing to do with her. No. I'm trying to figure yeah, out what's going on in the world. Then show me the proof. No, he's not leaving. Show me the proof. Hey, are you show me the proof. You better get on. Let's go, kid. I'm sorry. Better get on. We have what you you see you see two black people. No, I'm not letting him walk away with my phone. Oh boy. Okay, we got we got some questions for the doc on this one, um, as well as Anne. This is a California woman in a New York uh, hotel where she confronts a 14 year old of a famous person, um, Keon Harold who is a trumpetist, a trumpist, I'm not sure how you say that, not in president, I mean in the actual musical instrument. <laughs> and um, she confronts this 14-year-old boy and accuses him of stealing the phone and also, according to police reports or the reporting we're getting, assaults him, um, a simple assault. She was charged with two counts of attempted assault, attempted robbery, grand larceny, endangering the welfare of a child. She was found in California and she uh, has agreed to be extradited back to New York. She's also made statements that she is very, very sorry for what she did, and she apologizes, and she basically says something that I always love to say, and it's really true. You can't judge a person by a single moment in their life. Um, so she has shown some remorse, but her lawyer said something that I found very interesting, Doc. Um, she says, it's clear she, meaning her client, is emotionally unwell. And then in addition to that, we find out that there, uh, in the record, have been a number of uh, issues, I'd use the word decompensation. You may tell me I'm not using that scientifically correct, but she's never had any encounters with law enforcement before. But in the last year, she's had a number of run-ins, including DUIs and assaults, um, so alcohol-related, you know, kind of stuff. What do you What are you seeing in this woman um, in, in your mind right now? And I should note, by the way, um, Harold had said you should use find your iPhone. She wouldn't have have your find your iPhone on. 
but the phone was eventually recovered from an Uber right. that she had been in previously. But what is, is, is this something that's going on more and more in society where people are just exploding and being more accusatory? Is COVID part of it? Like, why are we seeing all these instances? Thank God this one wasn't ultimately something like a homicide. Why are we seeing this? I think it's more to do with the technology being available. Um, honestly, I, I don't see that uh, that it's happening more often. I think we're just capturing it on video more often and it's being played because of the sort of zeitgeist of everything that's happening right now. I would be very concerned about her overall emotional state if she's starting to get caught in DUIs and she's 22 years old. There might be some other things that are happening uh, with her, her overall mental health that she should probably get looked at. Yeah, it'd definitely be interesting to see whether or not, certainly as a defense lawyer, that's where I would be going and trying to say to the prosecutor and to the victim's family, can you show some you know, mercy and compassion because here's our report about what was going on. And I found that people, generally speaking, um, when they understand the context and they understand the person are generally decent, and that'll make a big decision as to how the prosecutor handles the case. Anyway, guys, got to switch gears here. Um, and the police in the UK are searching for a man that administered a fake COVID-19 vaccine. And it wasn't just that, and I'm sure we're going to see more of this. It was with regard to a 92-year-old woman. And the sub suspect fraudulently demanded that payment for the administration of the vaccine and said, the government will pay you the money back uh, later on. And then came back a second time to that vulnerable elderly suspect and said that he was demanding more money. Um, we don't know what was injected, or if anything was injected, she definitely had a needle type substance put in her arm. And we're told that she's fine, she's been checked out and she's not in any danger. And I don't know, uh, my prosecutor days, people would say no harm, no foul. I find this to be exceedingly disgusting. And I'd be making a point. You have a vulnerable 92 year old person that you're not only trying to extort, you put her into a health scenario where she thought she was getting a vaccine that she didn't. Um, how are you? How are you thinking this is going to go in terms of how prosecutors in the United Kingdom are going to treat this? Well, I, I think it's out. I'm with you. I think it's reprehensible, and there's a number of different kinds of crimes that could be prosecuted in this, obviously, including assault, you know, fraud, and things like that. Um, we don't know what was injected, so yeah, you can't really go further than the assault itself or battery. It's almost like informed consent in a medical case. You know, like she wouldn't have consented to the touching had she known that it was false, and then he came back. He was coming back and willing to commit fraud on her again, a very vulnerable victim. Yeah, Doc, I hate to always put you in these positions, but you know, I get fraud, I've seen fraud, but this one just has that extra special element of doing it to the elderly and doing it to the vulnerable. What, what, is, what is the psychological makeup of people that, that do this? I mean, to be honest with you, I know it's gonna sound crazy and don't, please, I don't want the audience to, I'm not condoning any violence, but I would look at somebody that committed a robbery of, of a healthy you know, person um, differently than I would somebody that did something so deceptive and dastardly to an elderly person. No, absolutely. And you know, the elderly are, are certainly one of the most vulnerable populations to be exploited financially. And especially right now, given the COVID times that we live in, fear is the primary emotion that most people are having. So it's not unsurprising that there are nefarious individuals that would exploit that fear to try to just get money, however much money they can. There's always someone out to do some kind of con. Um, and unfortunately, it's the elderly that get targeted the most often. Hey, Doc, you, met, you mentioned fear. Is that also a corollary that we can use from this case as well to the Capitol uh, insurrection? I mean, isn't fear really what's driving most of these people? Yeah, fear is a primary emotion. It, it, you know, when you look at anger, which is what emotion people saw the most at that Capitol rally, what's underneath it is the fear, a fear of the change of a way of life or fear of a change of uh, no, someone not supporting them, whatever it is, all of these individuals had some kind of fear that they turned outward towards anger. And so, yeah, fear being the primary emotion, absolutely. You know, and in our defense practice, we see all the time, and I got a short period of time for you to answer this, but we see the mentally ill, the addicted, the broken, the fearful that are drivers for most of the crimes they commit. Is that your experience as well? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I think fear is, is the main one. Um, and, and desperation. Yeah, and, and do you do you leverage that in favor of your clients with the prosecution? Right. I mean, it would, 
you have to have mens rea and actus reus, as we all know as lawyers. You have to have the intent and the act. But when you don't have the intent and you've got issues, uh, mental issues, then you've got to look at that. One in four people in this country suffer from some type of uh, mental uh, issue. I Recon guess I'm call it. I don't want to say all disease, right. but you know, it's a big issue. Guys, okay, and thank you. We got to go. Thank you for tuning in. Stay scheduled for our regular scheduled programming. <laughs>